so that's that's to me the issue is that it's it's really weak data making very strong statements that can create fear and shame and anxiety and also lead to unhealthy behavior because a lot of the evidence shows that there is there are benefits to alcohol Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. You're watching another episode of The Swift Harvey Snowden. I'm your guest, the titular Christopher Snowden. And uh, every two weeks I have a chat with somebody I would like to speak to. Sometime I've, uh, sometimes I've met them before, sometimes I haven't. In this case, I haven't met him or even spoken to him before. I just mm-hmm. don't know him from his work uh, in, uh, well, he writes about drugs and alcohol and history, really, uh, a bit like myself. Uh, he is uh, Professor Dan Malek. He's a professor at Brock University over in Canada in the Department of Health Sciences there. Uh, he's written a number of intriguing books. Uh, the most recent one I think came out last year, which is called, Dan, something in the liquor state? Liquor in the liberal state. Liquor in the liberal state. Right. Tell yeah, me about yeah. that before we go any further. I guess we could have called it liberalism in the liquor state, but... <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Right. Yeah. yeah, so this, uh, it's a, a pre, sort of pre-prohibition history looking at the development of sort of centralized liquor management in the province of Ontario and across Canada. Uh, and I sort of take on a lot of the discussion of um, the way the temperance movement and the the moderationists and the liquor interests all talked about the issue and framed it as something related to liberalism, right? Like freedom, equality, property rights, all of those different, and the different ways that liberalism sort of was manifest at this time, you know? So the temperance movement was always saying, you know, individual needs to be freed from the slavery of liquor and king alcohol and uh, the demon rum and all that stuff. And they use those sort of histrionic uh, um, cartoons and arguments and images. And then the, the, the liquor industry was saying, look, we have right to trade, we are licensed by the government, we should be free to do um, what we have are able to do. And if you want to take away those rights, you're going to need to um, pay us to do that, right? Because we have a lot of capital invested. And then all the moderationists in the middle were who are often not talked about in, in history, like the, the majority of people, I think, were just saying, you know what, this is just like, let us do what we want. Um, we can make our own decisions. We're rational actors, all of those sorts of things, right? So it was a really, uh, as, I, as I was researching this book, uh, which I never intended to write this book, I just sort of was looking at pre-prohibition liquor licensing and it just got bigger. At one point, halfway through the research, I went, this is all about liberalism. This is all that they're discussing and so i sort of reframed the story um around that and i think it really hangs together pretty well so in the that's title. very interesting because i had i had mark uh, shrad on the show last yeah. year you know him i presume yes um, yeah. i know his work i thought he might come up something sorry to promote his book rather than yours yeah, but, yeah that's uh, fine yeah. <laughs> smashing the lick in the shit i mean he's a, he's a lovely guy and i find his story but i mean i just fundamentally disagree with his basic premise which is touches exactly on, on what you're saying he, he was saying the prohibitionists were the true liberals uh, yeah in, in the u.s and, and everywhere really and i just don't get it i think he, he buys into the kind of the, the temperance rhetoric of the time in which they would talk about abolitionism and oh you know yeah. the, it, there's a kind of exploitative relationship between the industry and the drinker and i just don't i just don't see it yeah, yeah, you know, I haven't read that book of Marx. He did a lot of stuff on sort of Russian liquor uh, yeah. and drinking and stuff. So oh, I, I you know that read this one for sure. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. No, I just haven't got around to it. Right, but, it's a big one. But yeah, yeah, it looks like it's quite quite hefty just to pick yeah. it up there. Um, but that is one of the things I think that is a common thread through the temperance history is these are the progressives, these are the liberals, but they don't necessarily uh, interrogate the idea of liberalism right because it's it's not one thing i mean that those three pillars right equality freedom and property rights were fundamental but then by the end of the century uh there was a, a stream of liberalism that got into you know elevating the poor the disadvantaged who are ravaged by the sort of laissez-faire economics and, and sort of the, and, and that's where the temperance movement fit they saw themselves as uh, sort of almost, uh, I wouldn't want to say a new liberalism, but yeah, like a progressive thread progressive. of liberalism, right? Um, but it's easily um, uh, collapsed into their liberals and the others were conservatives, but it's not so simple, right? And that's why when I was looking at this topic, I went, this isn't just about conservatives and liberals. This isn't just about, 
you know, moneyed interests versus those who are out to protect the poor. These are very different threads of this idea of liberalism. And that's why it was so interesting to me, because it's a, a, a notion in Canadian history that we, our country was based on some kind of liberal order. But it's that, what does that liberal order mean? Like, what is liberalism? And everyone was arguing, you know, to be true Canadians, to be true British subjects, because they often talked about like British fair trade and British, or, sorry, British fair play, and and those sorts of things. Uh, they needed to talk about different. They, they drew upon different notions of freedom and liberty, right, um, and equality. Well, equality wasn't there, but the notion of justice, which is kind of an element of equality, was there very much in in the rhetoric, right? It's not fair to do this to the liquor industry. It's we need to be fair to those poor drunks who can't handle their liquor and all of that stuff. So it all came together. So yeah, no, it's 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 not such a simple binary, right? Like they were they were progressive in thinking that they and seeing themselves as they being the temperance movement and seeing themselves as leading towards a better world and their better world included no alcohol. But they were also very repressive in the sense that they were trying to sweep away this huge industry based upon a very narrow view of a certain type of drinking that was problematic. And most people weren't drinking that much. And Canadians actually didn't drink as much as the temperance movement said they did. And we still don't drink as much as people think we do. <laughs> um, so, so that's, yeah, that's the story I'm telling there. It's interesting that people always want to see themselves as liberals. You know, they never want <laughs> yeah. to see themselves as in any way oppressing people. And yeah. They'll go to huge lengths and use all kinds of sophistry and rhetorical tricks to portray themselves as liberals. I, I write in, in my book, Killjoys, yeah. even Mussolini did this. You know, yeah. even Mussolini talking about fascism portrayed himself as liberating. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's a really shocking uh, moment. I, I use that book. I, I teach that to my students, my public health students, who are usually really surprised by that kind of interpretation they're thinking that they're sort of on the side of the angels right but it's like yeah but you know when you're trying to force other people to do something you think is right uh, is that is that really liberal <laughs> you know so how do they respond to that kind of thing um uh, they're they're surprisingly more responsive than uh than i expected but there's always sort of a, a thread and it's I encourage like a critical thread right so it's like there's always this well is this too much or um some of them I had this really surprising conversation when I was talking to students one year about you know do you really want just to be told what to do doesn't that infringe on your freedom they're like yeah we kind of prefer just being told what to do and I was really? like what <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was like what <laughs> really <laughs> you're adults you can do it anyway yeah, I mean, the, my fear is that one day people won't even pretend to be to believe in liberal values anymore. There's no reason why they should necessarily. We just kind of assume it. And because yeah. most people, I still think, just about have this idea of live and let live, these people yeah. need to perform, you know, some kind of, you know, um, they need to give the right, you know, use the right language as it were to do that. But yeah. at some point, we might get to the stage where people just go, well, I don't like this. We should ban it. And that's all there is to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that's something that we we are seeing increasingly um, right now, right? So you, recently, you've been writing about a mm -hmm. very weird thing going on in Canada at the moment, which some viewers may have seen, um, which is that you seem to be quite close in Canada to having official guidelines for drinking, which say no more than two drinks per week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah up yeah. from it's about two drinks a day at the moment, right? Which is more yeah. than is in in Britain, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on the definition of a standard drink, right? right. So here, here it will be a twelve ounces of beer at five percent. It breaks down to zero point six percent or zero point six ounces of pure alcohol in a drink, right? So forty ounce or forty percent whiskey at one and a half ounces, that sort of thing. Same, the same math comes down to it. Yeah, and so we had the Canadian Centers on Substance Abuse and Addiction, which used to be the Canadian Centers on study of addiction i think that was their original name so you can see sort of their perspective mm -hmm. harm-based perspective uh saying to the government uh look you know these last guidelines came out in 2011 the guidelines that said for men 15 standard drinks a week no more than four in one time i think and for women 10 uh mm -hmm. same thing um 
So let's look at the current science and see and update them, right? Which isn't an unreasonable thing if you accept the idea of those guidelines, um, which, uh, you know, so Health Canada gave, the Health Canada sort of a branch of the government, gave money to the CCSA, said, okay, do it. And what they came back with was an incredibly biased, in my view, and in the view of increasing number of people, uh, and slanted uh take on uh, liquor guidelines. So all they were supposed to do was look at the research since 2011 and see if there's evidence for a change in those guidelines, not necessarily a reduction. And they they use the language of uh, we're looking at the, the, the benefits and harm or the harms and benefits of alcohol. But then what they did, not to get too deep into the weeds, is they went from about 6,000 um, uh, uh, studies that they started with and through a rigorous and overly uh, slanted filtering process got down to 16 articles. So they based their argument on 16 articles, some of which were meta studies that had their own filtering process. And so it was really kind of limited information, some of which were authored by some of the yeah. key researchers um, uh, who are, if not neo prohibitionists, at least neo-temperance in mentality. Um, and they came up with this. Uh, in August, it was zero to two drinks is the only safe amount. Uh, they sent, they put this report out for public consultation, which is weird to me to like, get, what, like crowdsource your opinion or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then when they came back to it, they had sort of massaged the message and uh, it became zero to two drinks is low risk or one to two drinks is low risk. The only safe limit is zero. One to two drinks is low risk. Three to six is moderate risk of certain diseases or three to seven. And then above seven, they, I think the language is you radically increase your uh, risk of harm, right? With one drink a day. Uh, yeah, yeah. One drink a day. Yeah. but. Um, but the, but but even on the surface, the the data is really problematic. I mean, even if you accept that those sixteen studies are the pinnacle of excellence, but they're not. There there's a lot of problems with those studies. Uh, the way they the, the 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 model of selection they use. I was talking to a colleague of mine who didn't know anything about this study, and I said they use this thing called the the great. I think it's called the great model. G R E A T, and they it's a way of sort of applying certain standards to filtering. And he I said, he said, Oh yeah, that's bullshit. Like that was his response to that. He knew it very well. He's a sort of a data person, but he didn't know anything about the study. So it's like, okay, <laughs> all right, another piece of the, the puzzle solved. Um, and then so even if you accept that data, they show things like ischemic heart disease and ischemic stroke are alcohol is protective up to at least seven drinks a week. And then what they show in their table is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven drinks. And then they jump to 14 drinks a week. Right. So they don't show eight. They don't show nine. And at 14 drinks, it's a slightly increased risk, like I think five percent increased risk, which means it's a relative risk relative to none, I guess, right? But they don't show eight, they don't show nine. But then in their actual little poor public consumption infographic, they say stuff like, they they say seven or beyond seven drinks a week radically increases your risk of these diseases up to seven drinks a week or at something like at seven drinks a week, you have an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. It's like, but that even your data doesn't say that, right? So it, there's an intense tell here that they are, trying to I say cook the books, but they're trying to present an ideological argument that even their own data doesn't support, right? They dismiss the J curve, the idea that, you know, moderate drinking is, is healthier than abstinence. They dismiss it. They always dismiss it, right? Even though it persists in, in a lot of the evidence. And then they ignore all sorts of research that talks about social connectedness and the healthy, uh, healthy behavior getting together with friends and how alcohol is sometimes part of that and the relaxation effects of alcohol and the social connect like bringing a, a bottle of wine to a party or getting together with some friend you know all of those things that goes together with drinking a lot that just doesn't matter to them it's gone it's all this dose response stuff right it's all about if you can somehow link statistically 
taking a drink and somewhere down the line, uh, it's a mar slightly increased risk of cancer or something like that, then, then that is what they took. And so it's really biased. It's really narrow. And it's terrified some people here. Like some people said to me, what, you know, what do I do with this information? I said, just ignore it. <laughs> right? because... People actually, I, I always kind of forget that some people actually might take this seriously. You know, just, oh, yeah. I mean, it's so obviously based on trying to change policy. And I, I just assume most normal people either don't know about it or, or just think it's laughable. And two drinks a week is so obviously absurd. It, so, yeah. You know, you say the last ones were 2011. That wasn't that long ago, right? That was only 12 years ago. Things yeah, don't change yeah. that much in science. And I've kept abreast of the science for the last 12 years. And if anything, J curve and all this other stuff has been strengthened, not weakened. Yeah. Yeah. The only exceptions being some pretty dodgy Mendelian randomization studies, mm -hmm. which take them seriously, show that alcohol doesn't cause any harm either. You know? Yeah, no, and that's exactly the problem is that they've been very selective. There was another, um, the, uh, the International Scientific uh, I can't remember, ISFAR, they're, they're a scientific body that looks at alcohol research. They roundly rejected this, condemned this in very strong words as incredibly biased and poor design and all of that stuff. I say it's uh, irresponsible research because it can actually cause harm, build stigma. I've spoken to former drinkers who are like recovered alcoholics who hate this because they're saying, we already know what it feels like to have stigma associated with drinking. You don't need more, right? So they're building that stigma as well. But yeah, there's been a lot. I mean, this, I was talking to one of our media people at my university recently, and they're saying, I, I'm amazed at how, how at the legs this story has. Like I've been talking about this since uh, September um, and we're still talking about it. And partly because when it started, the media did an uncritical acceptance of the report. They were like, wow, this is this is really amazing. And they bring in people from the, the, the CCSA to talk about it and, and talk. You were saying earlier about how everyone wants to represent themselves as liberal. A lot of what they would say is, well, we're just trying to provide clear information for people to make their own decisions. It's like that's the great rational actor, right? Like you provide information and people can make decisions. But the information is, is really skewed. So that was a big problem. And I got, I was really, I found this as a problem because I'm a historian of, of alcohol and temperance policy. I've seen the rhetoric before. People were saying to me, I'm really concerned about my drinking, even though I don't seem, didn't think I drank that much. And so I started to write about this and, and, and I can't take credit for being the person who changed the, the narrative, but I was really pushing to rethink this when a lot of the big in, including the canadian broadcasting corporation the cbc interviewed me and they were really critical and i thought but why aren't you critical of the ccsa like they're they're the ones who presented this bizarre take on the data um, and who have a lot more at stake in this than i do they always ask me if i have liquor industry money i have no funding to do this my funding is related to something else completely but the ccsa folks they make their careers on this kind of research right so let's talk about bias in a different uh, form i just talk about the the problem framework that they introduce alcohol is easy to fit into this problem framework people often accept it oh well it's you know it's just a luxury i mean maybe it is a problem you know we know people who are drunks and we know about drunk and driving and stuff like that but most people don't drink that way right so we have this cognitive dissonance between the thing, the pleasurable, socially acceptable drinking that most of us enjoy, and then some problematic drinking that seems to dominate our thinking about this. It was struck me, I didn't read the, the whole report, certainly not as thoroughly as you did, but I was looking at the, the basic summary and they were saying, as you as you already explained, you know, two drinks a week is kind of okay, but still, you know, not necessarily totally risk free. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you get to three, four, and five drinks, and that increases the risk of this, and then six and seven increases. And we all this stuff can only be based on observational epidemiology, right? Can only yeah. be based on asking people how much they drink and then following and, and seeing yeah, how they're yeah, and we simply do not have the data on people who yeah. drink three drinks a week versus people who drink five drinks a week versus mm -hmm. people who drink mm -hmm. six. We just don't have yeah. that data. Even yeah. if people were honest about what they drank in the first place, and we know that they only really declare about half of what they drink, which is mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. ignore. I mean, the epidemiologists know this, but they ignore it when they write up the studies. They just pretend, well, yeah, the, if this guy said he was drinking two drinks a day, he would yeah. have been. probably drank four drinks a day, which straight away changes your, your risk curve enormously yeah. but we simply don't have the data for that yeah. for those kind of people because they're really unusual 
So how how do they even magic up these figures? Is it just sort of uh, models? Well, I think this is the problem with their selection processes. They're they're looking at some fairly small studies and extrapolating to whole yeah. whole populations, so, right? So there's a study, the 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 one that just blew my mind when I saw them uh, mentioning this. And I actually heard CCSA reps in the media back in September and October talking about tuberculosis and drinking, right? Oh, and yeah. I went, this is one I of said, my favorites. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we're in, okay, so let's just be very clear. In Canada, you have a very low risk of contracting tuberculosis. And by the way, it's a bacterium. You have to be near someone who has it. Who, you have to catch it. Alcohol has nothing to do with catching it. Yeah. It may have some effect on reducing your immune response, right? But this study looks at the global burden of uh, tuberculosis and links it to drinking and looks at some areas, for example, in Africa, where it's it's endemic and where there might be more drinking in some cases. So they can see an association and then they extrapolate it to the rest of the world. It's like, I you can't do that, right? In Canada, the likelihood of catching tuberculosis is something like one in a million. I think 37, yeah. it's like unbelievable, right? And it's in certain communities, uh, certain socioeconomic conditions and all of these things, right? But that doesn't matter. That that context is gone from the CCSA's report. And they just threw tuberculosis in there. And then they started talking about it as if everyone and many people was like, oh, wow, I could get tuberculosis. From <laughs> yeah. no, you can't, unless it's in the bottle. <laughs> you know? I, I, I first came across them using tuberculosis to kind of, you know, make alcohol look very dangerous, even at low levels. A few years ago, I think it was a Lancet study that kind of tried to do the same thing as what these yeah. guys are doing in Canada and saying, actually, there's no safe level. And I, I was intrigued about how, how would alcohol cause tuberculosis. And when I looked into it, there were two kind of theories, really. The first was, like you say, it might, you know, alcohol could reduce your immune response. But that seemed to be totally speculative, as far as I could tell. Mm -hmm. The second one, the main one, was people who drink are more likely to go to bars. And if they go to bars, they'll meet other people and they might catch tuberculosis from them, which yeah. you might not say alcohol causes COVID. In fact, that yeah. was kind yeah. of the reason they closed down. Um, all the yeah. liquor stores in South Africa during COVID was because you know, they didn't want people associating, which you can, you can kind of see that in a way, yeah. but yeah. still you wouldn't actually say that alcohol causes COVID, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And yet they make these really, they, the, the great thing about t tables like this is, you, you know, it's it's a choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? Like they don't say, look, this causes that, but they show these really in bright red, whenever it's over 50% increased risk, um, that it's in bright red. So that means that, oh, you should really be worried when your risk of getting something is some of these conditions is incredibly low. Um, something like breast cancer, which had a higher uh, has a higher death um, numbers than uh, a lot of the other uh, illnesses. There are a whole bunch of things that that um, go into determining someone's risk of breast cancer, and drinking is not a main one. Right. So all of those things, even I have learned this recently, even cirrhosis of the liver isn't exclusively related to drinking. I thought it was right. So there's things with diabetes and stuff like that. And still the data shows and their data shows. And you know this, that di uh, alcohol is protective against diabetes up to like it's just across the board. There's no point when maybe at 30 or 40 drinks a week when you might have a higher risk of diabetes. So there's really weird stuff happening here. And it's if you if your perspective is alcohol is a problem it's easy to ignore the benefits right and that's the problem with the study is that there someone here said um having the ccsa uh just uh, set alcohol guidelines in drinking guidelines is like having PETA uh regulate the meat the meat industry right <laughs> like you know having the you know, ethical treatment of animals regulate meat industry because it's just they're they're so biased yeah. against that, right? And that's unfortunately, it hasn't been rejected by the government. It hasn't been accepted by the government. They don't quite know what to do with this. And when you have a policy vacuum that has been created and then this is the only thing filling it, people look at it and go, oh, well, those are the new Canadian guidelines. Right. And that's <laughs> that's a huge problem. Sorry, I'm so yeah, excited. Yeah. I'm losing my headphones. <laughs> well, I mean, you can, there's going to be a huge international outlier. You know, as you know, some of them, I wasn't that surprised to see Canada go lower than anybody else because I know that uh, a couple of people, at least, um, on the committee have been kind of touring the world for a few years now trying to get other countries to reduce their guidelines. You've had the team at Sheffield University 
involved in doing the modeling for the UK guidelines when they came down and you know they literally changed their model because they were basically told to by by um, by public health England um, and then went to Australia and created another model and every time they do it the, the guidelines come down can you yeah. explain to viewers who might not understand what's the significance of this you know when these people say look we're only giving advice why why are they being disingenuous um, I think, um, sorry, do, do you mean they're being, dis why, why are they themselves it's, doing this? It's ingenuous to say, oh, we're, we're only giving advice people can yeah. want to, you know, what, what's the Yeah, point? well, it does have the weight of official kind of sanction, right? It's it, this idea that, and, and we saw this early back in January, a lot of people are saying these are the new Canadian government guidelines, right? So it has this sense that um, we are now in a, what what I'm doing, drinking under the old guidelines is actually dangerous for me, and I'm worried. There's sort of a biopolitical thing as well, where um, to be a good citizen, you know, uh, you have to show proper behavior. And if you start, oh my goodness, that guy had three drinks today at the pub. Oh no, yeah, he's an irresponsible Canadian, right? It's it's this this sense of responsibility, irresponsibility, um, which can lead to stigma, anxiety. It's the same sort of thing we have here. If if a woman who is visibly pregnant is seen to have like half a glass of wine or half a pint right. of beer, like people think, oh, she's a bad mother. Well, no, not really. But according to the official, we actually in, in the province of Ontario, bars have to have a sign saying that no, there's no safe limit of drinking in pregnancy, which is the, the data also doesn't show that. Right. But even when I say that, people think, oh, my God, he's saying pregnant women should drink right so so that's that's to me the issue is that it's it's really weak data making very strong statements that can create fear and shame and anxiety and also lead to unhealthy behavior because a lot of the evidence shows that there is there are benefits to alcohol both direct health benefits and sort of those broader social social connectedness benefits which a lot of the research in the UK on social connectedness shows that it's it's healthier for you than quitting smoking, right? And people agree that quitting smoking is generally healthy for people, right? So again, if I say that, they think I'm encouraging people to smoke, which... <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I, I think there's one other aspect to it. I mean, uh, yeah. I think you know, Canadians are probably more conscientious than British people. There, there's been a couple of studies come out looking at since 2016, when the UK dropped its guidelines, whether people have changed their behaviour or even know about them and, and know what's mm -hmm. over those. The vast yeah. majority of people have no idea what the guidelines are at all. I suspect Canadians pay a bit more attention to this kind of thing. But one of the other effects of reducing the guidelines, and that's certainly been the case in, in the UK, is overnight you create millions of new hazardous drinkers. Yeah. Right? yeah. So the, the, the issue of, of people drinking more and more dangerously, which has kind of been fading away for 10, 15 years in the UK, is people yeah. drink less. Or certainly drink less, you know, in terms of binge drinking. Suddenly, you, you could be magicked up all these yeah. hazardous drinkers. The problem's got twice as bad. The government must do more. Yeah, you're right, and and it can lead into sort of clinical guidelines for physicians. Although I've heard from a lot of physicians who have said, "Thank you for writing what you're writing. This is absolutely ridiculous." There are others who are doubling down on it, and now they'll look at it as someone who says, you know, they say, "How how much do you drink a week?" Oh, you know, four or five drinks. Oh, well, you know, that's risky. Like, yeah. So is driving to the clinic, you know, but I drove to the clinic to, to talk to oh, A bit more risky, I would have thought. Yeah, well, exactly, right? So there's the risks that we accept because they, they've seen as functional, like driving somewhere, and risks that we don't accept because, or, or are less likely to accept because they're seen as frivolous, like drinking. And that's, and, and it's not frivolous. It's, it's actually very essential to our social connectedness in many cultures, at least. Certainly in my culture. Dan, yeah. we've already run out of time. Can you believe it? Um, yeah. Talk for a lot longer. I certainly could talk to you for a lot longer. But that's the way we like it on this show. We always like to leave waiting for more. Um, Absolutely. If people want to follow you on Twitter, what's your what's your handle? It's at Dan Malik. So D A N M A L L, -L E C K. Dead simple. Um, and if you want to hear more from Dan, why not read one of his books? A number of very interesting books. I'm going to pick up your most recent one. It seems like. Uh, get through the, the, the pile of books I've already been through. But thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Very, My very pleasure. interesting stuff. That, um, and uh, yeah, take care. And take care at home. Thanks for watching. Thank you if you're an IEA donor. If you want to become one, go to iea.org.uk slash donate. Um, and we'll see you. you are, you'll see me in two weeks' time. Don't know who I'll be talking to, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be worth tuning in for, as this one certainly has been. Take care, thank you, and goodbye. Thanks, Chris. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? 
And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.